This morning's reading comes from John, chapter 15, verses 1 to 17. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. No, sorry, remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's, friend, one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I will no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love one another. How are we doing? It's a good passage, eh? Um, I, so I had prepared my sermon earlier in the week and had it all thought out internally, had thought a lot about it, but hadn't actually spoken it out and practiced it. Um, so Caleb gave me an hour this morning before church. I came up to the office to practice it. He got the kids sorted. And do you know what happened when I started, when I opened, I've shared this before at beginning of sermons because it happens to me all the time. I opened the Bible and I started speaking and I had a half hour sneezing fit. I don't get, um, what is it, hay fever. There's something, there's like a spiritual thing where I just cannot stop sneezing and my eyes are watering and I can't read God's word and I'll start speaking, I'm sneezing. It was just this watering, sneezing mess. So I had an hour and it cut back to half an hour, so I haven't actually fully practiced it because, and I was doing like warfare, I was like, in Jesus' name, but I stopped sneezing. It was full on. So pray for me next time I preach that I wouldn't have sneezing fits. But anyway, I firmly believe that it's because God has got something really, really great for your hearts this morning and that he's got some stuff and some truths that are going to bring life to our um, journey with Jesus and are going to be a fruit in our life. And I just want to say that this morning, it's an obvious thing to say, but I'm so convinced of the reality of Jesus in our midst. I'm so convinced that Jesus is real and he is alive and he is here. And I want us to be assured of that. But I also want each and every one of us to leave today with it even deeper, holy dissatisfaction that we would pine for and yearn for more of Jesus in our lives and more of God in this world. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm just going to pray. Imagine if I just sneezed all through my sermon. <laughs> I was thinking that. I was like, why? Anyway, let's just pray that doesn't happen. Jesus, we thank you that you are good and that you are here and that you are the ground of our very being. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and soften our hearts that you would give us courage to hear your truths this morning for us, and that we would step into more of life with you. 
So just want to do a little recap for our Lent series. We're looking at a chunk of John, and I just want to remind us the purpose of the book of John. Why is it even in the Bible? And it is clearly stated for us in chapter 20, verse 31. It reads, But these are written, these things are written, so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. So this gospel is written literally so that we may know that Jesus is the Messiah and that we can have life in him. And Jesus came as a human to make God known to us. Isn't that amazing? It's awesome. So we get to step into that reality this morning of the purpose of John. I want to break John, just a brief overview just to locate where we are. I want to break John into six bits. And all flow nicely onto each other. So we've got the intro. We're at beginning where it talks about Jesus being the word. And then it goes on to um, him gathering his first disciples and there's different titles given for Jesus. He's the Messiah, he's a rabbi, he's the, um, he's the Lamb of God, he's the Son of God, he's the King of Israel, Jesus of Nazareth. So he's given all these titles and it kind of sets the picture of who this guy is. And then we go into a big chunk, chapters 2 through to 10, where we see all these incredible signs and wonders and miracles, beginning with water being turned into the abundance of Jesus and the joy of Jesus, the party side of Jesus. And basically in this chunk, all these signs and miracles and wonders happen and we see how people respond. They either reject or accept. But we see a lot of pushback and a lot of love. There's just like, how are people going to respond? It's a question for us. How are we going to respond to Jesus this morning? And then we've got kind of the, the middle, a crescendo, you could say, where Jesus goes to visit his friend Lazarus and rises him from the dead. But the controversial bit about this is that it means he has to go to Jerusalem, which basically means that in his going there, he's handing himself up for death. And so then we have uh, 13 to 17 this beautiful um, section of John where Jesus spends his final night with his disciples, speaking to them, praying to God in front of them, and basically explaining to them what's going to happen and what the reality for them now is going to be. And then 18 to 20, the narrative of his death and resurrection. And then at the end, which I'm going to come back to later, is the epilogue, which teaches us um, some really important truths as well. But our bit here that we're going to section, um, focus on today comes from this section, this beautiful discourse that Jesus has with his disciples in chapter 15 with the powerful words of, I am the vine, you are the branches, and God is the, the gardener, basically. Okay, so we're going to focus on this bit here. And there's three bits from this little bit of the speech that I want to focus on, that I want to make a point about. The first is, let's do a different colour that we have got full access. How do you spell access? I'm having a panic moment. Double C, double C and double S. <laughs> we have got full access that this journey requires obedience and the outcome of obedience is fruitfulness, okay? So I wanna break it down and I'm gonna spend a bit of time. Oh, I just spell fruitfulness, is there two L's? Fruitfulness. I never was good at spelling, eh, mum? <laughs> um, funny story, she bought me a charm for my charm bracelet from Michael Jula on Victoria Avenue when I was 10 years old because I remembered how to spell the word said, S-A-I-D, S-A-I-D. I was reciting it on my way. I really struggled with spelling. Anyway, there we go. We're going to look at um, the title, I Am the True Vine. Full access. Okay, so I, every year, well, no, many years since I was a teenager, have been going to a women's conference in Auckland called Sisters. Has anyone heard of that conference? It's very Pentecostal, very out there, very not Anglican, but I love it. And I go with some friends um, on years that I can. And last year I booked my tickets in advance and I got flights for like $35 there and back. And I was like, yes, so I booked the tickets, um, bought my conference ticket at the early bird rate and we'd sorted out our accommodation, sorted. Then a few weeks ago in a meeting up in the office, I realised 
that the AGM combined service clashes with my flights. <laughs> I was like, do I really have to be at the AGM? Yes, Billy, you do, you're the co-vicar. <laughs> okay, so I've had to book flights because I would have arrived back at like 1.30 p.m., which would have been just as they, you know. So I went on to Air New Zealand to book my flights, $186. Anyway, I do it because I love all of you and I want to be here, right? Um, the thing I find really fascinating about booking flights is your first decision, there's lots of decisions to make, yeah? Are you going to pay for an extra bag and are you going to pay for Flexi or are you just going to buy the cheapest one and just take your little 7 kg bag? I took that one. I only need a few things, not going with the kids. So that's the first decision I make. You click Next. Then you can make the decision, do you want to pay $5 to select your own seat or $10 to select an exit row seat? I'll save the money to buy a coffee, thank you very much, and I'll just sit wherever I am told. <laughs> next decision, when you click next, do you want to clear your conscience and play for a carbon emission-like fee? <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, not really, I do lots of other good things, I don't want to spend my money on that, so click no and next. Then the next decision you get to make is do you want to pay for insurance so that you can live in the freedom of knowing that should something happen, I don't have to book another ticket and not live with that fear. But no, I don't want to spend extra money when I'm already spending $186, so I click next. <laughs> and then there's another decision I get to make. Do I want to book a hire car or some accommodation through Air New Zealand because then you get a little bit of a discount. I'm like, no, I don't want to do that because I have already booked those things. So I click next. I'm really ready to pay for this ticket. And then I'm asked, do you want to use air points towards paying for your flight? I'm like, actually, that would be great. So how many air points have I got? I've got 56. So I can play part air points, part cash. The thing is, is if you do part payment, you have to pay an $8 fee. It's like, <laughs> I did pay the $8 fee because it still meant I got like $48 off. But I was like, we live in a culture where you have to keep like paying for stuff, eh? Yeah. To get better access to stuff. Yeah. I was like, my mum, bless her, I'm so blessed. She had like a full on gold, I think they call it black membership at City Fitness, which means she gets full access to everything. But for the same price, she could pay for two basic like memberships and she gave one to me so that means I can go to the gym and she can go to the gym but it means we don't get access to the classes or to the massage chair I think there's something else to get access to but it's like just we live in a light in a society we have to keep paying for things and it's like money makes you happy because you can get more things that's not true but you know what I'm saying like we kind of anyway um what I'm wanting to say in all of this is that we have this beautiful gift from God in our passage this morning. I don't know if you caught it, but in John chapter 15, verse 15, it reads these incredible words. You ready for it? You don't have to get your credit card out for this one. <laughs> I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. Those words are true for us sitting in here this morning. That God has made known everything for us, to us. That he has heard from, from his father. Whoa. Full access. Full access access to the resources of heaven and to the goodness of God. I can't even comprehend that. That's incredible. It is such abundance and such pursuit of us because he chooses us and he wants us and he wants us to have full access. He wants us to be in friendship with him. And I like to use the illustration of marriage to help us understand this a bit more because on our wedding day, we said to each other, all that I have, I share with you and I give to you within the love of Christ. That is a promise that Caleb and I made to each other on our wedding day. But we have a choice to either coast along life with each other or to actually turn and get to know each other. We promise that you have full access, that everything I have I share with you, but we can only actually share that with each other if we choose to do that. Do you get what I'm saying? 
And it's the same with Jesus. He says, everything that I have is for you. I share with you. But we have the choice as to whether we're actually going to step into that life with him. And this has to be the truth. Because earlier, just before in um, chapter 14... What was my little reference here? Chapter 12. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do and in fact will do greater things. It is promised that we are going to do greater things than Jesus did during his time here on earth. And why is that possible? Because we have full access. It's incredible. This is mind-blowing. The creator of the universe comes in human form and humbly says to us, to humanity, to his sons and his daughters, I give you everything. We have full access and he wants us to know that we are grafted into the vine and that he wants you as you are grafted in the vine. And this full access is so good. Why is it so good? Because he is the source of love. Nothing bad can come from this invitation. What's the key to staying in this relationship of full access with Jesus? What is the key to entering this relationship And how do we stay? The answer is obedience. Now this word obedience doesn't have doesn't always have great connotations in culture, does it? Because actually, you will obey me has been abused real bad. Real bad. In parent-children relationships, in spouse relationships, in work relationships, there's been yuck abuses of power. But I can assure you this morning that when Jesus says the words, you are to obey my commands, there is no abuse at all in that. There is only beauty and goodness. There is goodness and godliness. And the proof of his intentions when he says obey my commands is made clear to us in verse 17 of our passage this morning. It says, I am giving you these commands to obey so that you may love one another. It's not for him. Well, in some ways it is because he gets to see his sons and his daughters living in beautiful relationship with one another. But literally all of this spiel about obedience and abiding and having full access and entering this journey of discipleship is for the purpose of us loving one another. That's just pure beauty. Pure beauty from the source of love. I just want to take us through in our passage the four times where Jesus invites us to obey and then to see what the four results are if we do that. Um, So the invitations are those who abide, if you abide, if you keep my commandments, abide in my love. They're the four invitations to obedience. And the result of that obedience are these four things, that you will bear much fruit that his father, that God will be glorified, the promises that through obedience you will abide in his love, and finally he has said these things so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. He's doing all this so that we have complete joy in our hearts. This is just beauty all over the shop. It's incredible. I just want to say, though, that some of this obedience journey can feel brutal because it requires pruning. And the process of pruning can feel real hard because what season do we prune our roses and our our trees in? In the winter, yeah? And it can feel real frustrating because Jesus is in no hurry. He's got eternity to sort us out. Um, Hayden drew drew attention to this really incredible song, and if you're taking notes or listening on live stream or mental note, the song is called Tend by Bethel, and it's based on John 15. I just want to read out some of the words from it. In the landscape of my life, you don't rush through any season. You always take your time, a careful hand, a gentle guide, 
You take what's dead away and you prune what's running wild. So be the gardener of my heart, tend the soil of my soul, break up the fallow ground, cut back the overgrown, and I won't shy away. And then this is the line that has like, really got me this week. I will let the branches fall. It's one thing to allow the pruning, but then I don't want to let go of the branches because actually that feels real vulnerable and real exposed and I don't actually think I want to let go of this thing because that feels like I don't have control anymore. Powerful, eh? Um, I'm going to come back to pruning in a moment, but I just, yeah, on this, this, this thing of obedience, I want to come back to, I want to come to this part of John. I don't know if you can remember what happens after Jesus is resurrected and he's standing on the water side. Chapter 21. Just going to take us back there. It's actually quite funny. There's a very funny bit in this. Okay. Um, this is a picture of discipleship. Okay. So Jesus has resurrected. He's appeared to his disciples. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they say, all right, can we come too? So into the boat they get, and that night they caught Nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the other side. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord! When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked. (laughs) That's real random. And he jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about 100 yards off. Great story, eh? But basically, it's a great model of discipleship, that when we listen to Jesus and obey, and actually cast the net on the other side, go the other direction that he's leading you to, you will bear fruit. If we obey, there will be fruitfulness. The promise is fruitfulness. I like to think of it like this, that the kingdom of God is like New Zealand in Fijoa season. Yeah? Yeah? Or the kingdom of God is like New Zealand in marrow season. Enough of those marrows. There's so, so many of them, so big. But I just want you to picture, like, Fijoa season in New Zealand. There's buckets of Fijoas in church foyers and at reception desks and, and companies. And it's like we've got, I don't know, a few Fijoa trees in our garden, but, like, our ground is just covered in them. And every week when we go to mow the lawns, we've got to buckets and buckets and buckets, and we're making Fijoa crumble, even though people don't really like Fijoa crumble in our house. We're making Fijoa jam, Fijoa on our muesli, all the things. And then people are dropping Fijoas off to us, even though we've got lots of Fijoas, and we're taking Fijoas to them because we don't want the Fijoas anymore. Can you imagine if each and every one of us was like a Fijoa tree? In season. Whether you like Fijoas or not, I'm just like the image of just like ridiculous amounts of Fijoas just like everywhere. That that would be the fruitfulness that we see in our lives. The love of Jesus just overflowing and impacting others. How awesome would that be? It would look real weird if we were walking around like producing like Fijoas. But if you imagine that image of the love of God. Imagine what your life could be looking like more and more. And I want to come back to this pruning image because our passage begins with this amazing truth that he is the vine and the father is the vine grower. Okay, so that statement. What, what comes next? Can we remember? 
He cuts off every branch that doesn't bear fruit. And even if it does bear fruit, he's cutting it off so it can produce more. This is the first thing that is mentioned. The brutality of pruning and cutting stuff off. But that is how we bear fruit. And the process of pruning is us coming before Jesus daily and saying, Jesus, I want to walk in your way. If you're calling me to put the net on the other side, I want to know that I need to do that. The thing is, is that have you ever seen a pruned, a really pruned tree? You can feel a little bit like, oh my gosh. And like, I can remember growing up, my dad's parents would come and prune their trees and would come outside and we're like, whoa, that's like intense pruning. That like, and there, have, there were times when they pruned too far and it didn't then grow more fruit. But it's like, <laughs> I feel like it can feel in our lives that when we're pruned, it's like a panic moment where you go outside and all the beautiful roses have been cut off and it looks bare, doesn't it? And I think that for us, the challenge is to remain when we're feeling that panic, when we're feeling vulnerable and exposed, because we've come before our Lord and he said, hey, Billy, this needs to change. It's like, okay, Lord. And the invitation is to remain in that moment where you feel bare and exposed, because the promise is that you will keep growing and you will produce more fruit, and it is him that will do that work in and through us. The purpose that we are made for is to be his disciples and to go and bear fruit. Sounds kind of simple, eh? And how do we do that? By abiding, by remaining with him. And I just have a little note here. What does it even mean? Like, what does fruitfulness even look like? What does it mean? The thing about a tree that bears fruits is that it doesn't have to, like, go like this. It just naturally happens. If the soil is well tended, that is the natural thing that a tree does. It produces fruit. And the thing about the fruit is that it is for sharing. And that fruitfulness in our lives should look like not only good works. There's lots of good works out there. But it needs to be in relationship with the character of Christ being evident in our lives. And if you don't prune a tree, the energy stays stagnant. That's the whole thing, that you cut the, you prune it so that the energy can then produce more. If you don't prune it, the, the tree will just kind of, meh. the energy is stagnant. We don't want a church full of stagnant Christians, do we? No, we want Fijoa trees. <laughs> right, I'm going to come into landing and answer the question that you might be sitting there thinking, also just want to premise this with, there's a lot of awesome fruit in our, in our lives and in our church. I'm not saying we're all losers and that, you know, we're starting at ground zero. I'm not saying that. But I want us to go out today with a holy dissatisfaction that there is more on offer. So what do we do? I've got five things for you to take away of what we can do so that we can bear more fruit for his kingdom and for our city that is in need and our globe that needs the light to shine in the darkness. And that happens in and through us in our obedience. The first thing that I'm going to write these words up. Okay. Five takeaways. And you don't even have to pay me for these. I'm giving them to you for free. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Wonder. And I want to thank my friend Tabs for helping me to wonder again at a musicians gathering and audiovisual gathering team meeting that we had a few weeks ago. She invited us to, she basically said that the most important thing for anyone serving in the church, well, in this reference, let's say a worship leader, the priority is to wonder at the awesomeness of God. The second is to encourage those around you to wonder the awesomeness of God. And third, learn the guitar brackets, optional. <laughs> Basically just saying that our relationship with God and knowing the goodness of God is the most important thing, whether we're serving tea, whether we're welcoming at the door, if we're visiting someone who's in need, the most important thing is that we do that in relationship with God and that we're taking his love in everything that we do. So I want you to sit and spend some time thinking about the awesomeness of God and the awesomeness of the truths that we see 
in this passage this morning. That all of this that Jesus is talking about so that we can love him and love others and that the world would know. So let's wonder afresh at this person, Jesus, and his selfless nature. The second one is to, is to stay in relationship with others. Keep turning up to church. If you're part of a small group, small group, turn up to it. If you're not part of a small group, join one. If you're not in the habit of praying with brothers and sisters in Christ, find a prayer buddy. Go have a cup of tea with someone. If you know someone who is on the fringe of church that you haven't seen for a while, give them a call and say, hey, can I come over for coffee? There are so many people out there who just need someone to listen to them. And I can assure you that your life will bear fruit and their life will bear fruit because of that moment of connection. So keep staying in relationship with one another. We are all branches on this vine. We are part of a body. Let's care for each other and keep showing up for each other. Communion. I say communion, but I actually mean all of the traditions and the parts of the service that we have are thought through. Um, And my encouragement to you is to not just see it, which I sometimes do, um, something that we get through in the service, like the peace or confession or communion, but actually step into these spaces that we create to go deeper with Jesus. So when you come up for communion, which we're not having today, but on the weeks that we do, as you take the bread and you eat it, you remind yourself of the nourishment that we have in Jesus. And as you drink the wine or the juice, you're reminded of the sacrificial nature of Jesus that we're called to model. As we, as we have our moments of confession, literally bring before Jesus the things that you want changed in your life. As we share the peace, use it as an opportunity to help someone feel buoyed because, well, you just prayed a blessing over them or you said, it's really nice to see you this morning. Use these, these moments that we have, these traditions that we have to abide for Yep. His word. Allow his word to shape you. There are so many voices and so many words out there that shape and form us. And the one that needs to be forming us is his word. So an encouragement to keep going back to his word. And my final freebie is, it's actually the title of Man, my handwriting's not great, eh? Doesn't look very pretty, but that's okay. Um, Eugene Peterson's book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. It's a long obedience in the same direction. We keep choosing every day, and as we go off to the right side of the boat, we come back to what he's calling us to, and we're in it for the long haul. Like in our marriage, we're in it for life. We're in this thing for life. We're in it for eternity, this journey with Jesus. Let me pray. Jesus, you are so, so good, and you are so tangible right now. You are so tangible. You are the ground of our very being. And we thank you for this beautiful metaphorical language that we can, we can connect with. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you give us the courage to obey and to go where you are leading us. And I pray, Lord Jesus, for more fruitfulness in our parish, in our city, in our world, in our lives, Lord Jesus, that we would be expectant of more. Help us to wonder in you what the Almighty can do. We bless your name. I just want to leave a moment of quiet to allow you to ask Jesus the question, what are you inviting me into today? And what am I going to do about it? Speak to us, Lord.